Can the universe exist without God? Professor William Lane Craig is, is one of the leading contemporary philosophers of religion, uh, famous for his defense of a version of the cosmological argument in particular. Professor Kari Enqvist uh, is professor of cosmology at this university and also uh, an Academy of Finland research professor, and, and he's, uh, he's also very well known in, in Finland, uh, not only because of his scientific work, but also because of his uh, popular science books. Professor Enqvist, you will kindly start. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, the topic of discussion here this morning is can the universe exist without God? Mm. This is a question with words that beg for definition. The universe exists God. What is the universe? What does it mean to exist? And what exactly is meant by the word God? We all understand what is meant if I say the planet Mars exists. I can explain that Mars is a body that orbits the Sun between the Earth and Jupiter. I can give it size. I can describe its color. In principle, we can go and check if Mars exists. Um, we can send out an astronaut. If she reports back that no such thing can be found, I am forced to admit that despite my extreme fondness of the planet Mars, Despite the many stories in venerable old books, it does not actually exist. But what is the manner in which God is supposed to exist? To me, the question is ill-defined. I do not know what God means. What is God? The question brings to mind an unsung philosopher of our times, President Bill Clinton, asked whether he had lied about having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. He replied, uh, it depends on what the meaning of the word is, is. <laughs> to me, the sentence, God exists, is in the same equivalence class as the sacred syllable om. It is an expression of an emotion not a factual proposition. For Hindus and Buddhists, repeating the mantra Om has a high religious significance. However, a, a quick googling reveals that there is no consensus as to what Om actually means. Yet people feel the need to say it. Uh, this is of course fine. I have nothing against Om. However, if someone were to ask, can the universe exist without OM, I would feel that this is not a scientific question. Today, I'm speaking to you as a scientist who is actively doing research. To set the record straight, I should also tell you that I am without faith. To me, God is not emotionally significant. I would hesitate to call myself an atheist or agnostic. My lack of belief in God is not something that defines me as a person. Uh, 100 years ago, the philosophers Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead published their monumental Principia Mathematica. Their ambitious aim was to derive mathematics from, uh, from pure logic. On page 86 of their volume 2, volume 2, page 86, they fa finally managed to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2, a proposition that is occasionally useful, as they wrote. In my book of things, God makes his appearance at a similar location, somewhere in the second volume, possibly on page 86, perhaps as a footnote stating that, of course, he does not exist a proposition that is occasionally useful, but hardly very surprising. And I submit that to the overwhelming majority of religious people, faith is not a matter of knowledge, but emotion. And the same holds for lack of faith. However, uh, there are some who claim that belief in God is a matter of evidence. They think that the question like, can the universe exist without God? is a meaningful scientific question. To support their view, 
They discuss apparent cosmological fine tunings found in nature. They invoke logical arguments, uh, like uh, an example is provided by the many variations of the cosmological argument. These have been around ever since the Middle Ages. Uh, they rely on naive catchphrases like nothing can come out of nothing, or syllogisms like whatever begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, and therefore the universe has a cause called God. Uh, the problem is that we have actually known for 30 years that nature does not obey classical logic. I refer to the celebrated experiment of Alain Aspect and collaborators. It has been repeated many times with the same metaphysically profound uh, result. Aspect was using photons to test certain aspects of quantum physics, the so-called Bell's inequalities, but his results are independent of quantum physics. Uh, simply stated, he verified that nature does not obey the laws of classical probability theory uh, and hence the laws of classical logic. The law of excluded middle, one of the cornerstones of classical logic, does not hold in nature. It is as if a property of an object can simultaneously both exist and not exist. And as if this were not enough, we also know that there are things that begin to exist without any cause. Quantum physics has virtual particles that pop out of nothing for no reason whatsoever. Uh, and let me stress that I am talking about the physical nothing, not some philosophical nothing founded on mere words and intuition. Physical nothing is reality. Philosophical nothing, like unicorn, is a product of human mind. Time began at Big Bang, but does this mean that the universe began to exist at that point? Many theoretical physicists believe that because of quantum effects uh, that we don't yet know how to describe, time, time itself, as well as the concept of to begin, may be emergent properties, close to Big Bang, time and perhaps even cause and effect are likely to become blurred in, in some fashion. Uh, not even wrong. This is how Wolfgang Pauli, one of the main architects of quantum physics, used to describe ideas that he thought were without any merit. The same could be said about the tired old pseudological sound bites like the cosmological argument. They have been expounded for a thousand years. But what has all this scholastic juggling about the existence of God given us? Bombastic words, nothing concrete. In the final analysis, nothing at all. If this were a scientific research program, its funding would have been cut a long time ago. When it comes to foundations of reality, do not trust logic. Of course, this by no means indicates that one cannot trust science. It just means that one has to be very careful. Do not trust philosophical arguments, because they are just words. Do not believe in claims that one can know something about the universe by simple reasoning. This would amount to a misunderstanding of the role and the possibilities of philosophical inquiry. Like Ludwig Wittgenstein said, there are no discoveries in philosophy. For discovery, one needs science. When people make statements that start with like, it is self-evident that, or there can only be three possibilities, you should not believe them. I mean, it is evident that the sun orbits the earth, but it does not. It is evident that when I shoot a beam of light in one direction, and another one in the opposite direction. They move with respect to each other with the velocity that is twice the speed of light. But they do not. It is evident that the particle cannot be here and there at the same time. But it can. The lesson is, all those things that we take self-evident may be wrong. And if you think quantum physics is philosophi philosophically weird, well, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Let me give you an example. 
two theories are said to be dual to each other if all the observables in one theory can be mapped into the observables of another theory. A well-known example is the description of a black hole in five-dimensional space-time of a certain type. It is known to be dual to a theory of a hot gas of certain elementary particles in four-dimensional space-time that has no black hole whatsoever. All of this is very theoretical, and at least for the moment, duality has nothing to do with the universe that we observe. The philosophical ramifications are nevertheless quite interesting. In my example, an observer living in the five-dimensional space-time would see an empty universe with a black hole and four spatial dimensions. However, she would have no means of ruling out the possibility that she actually lives in a universe with one dimension less uh, that is filled with a hot radiation of particles and, and has no black hole. There would be no way of knowing for sure. No observation, no philosophical argument could settle the issue. Therefore, one must be very careful before making any sweeping statements about reality. Perhaps a three-dimensional world with God and a bunch of believers is dual to a four-dimensional universe with one single devil. And which one would be the true reality? There would be no way to tell. Religious apologists are fond of taking small probabilities and multiplying them to get even smaller probabilities. They claim that the universe is so unlikely place for human beings that it must have been created by God. Some 300 years ago, Isaac Newton was equally certain that God must interfere with the motions of the solar system. Planets did not quite seem to follow his laws of gravity. Uh, Jupiter was accelerating while Saturn was decelerating. And therefore Newton thought that God needs to fix things every now and then. However, 100 years later, Pierre-Simon Laplace demonstrated that Saturn and Jupiter perturb each other's motions. Accelerations and decelerations were shown to be a direct consequence of Newton, Newton's laws. And, and suddenly the evidence for God's action had evaporated. And if this can happen once, it can happen many times. One should really bear in mind that modern science is a, a very young enterprise. 100 years ago, people, including Einstein, thought that the Milky Way was all the universe there is. 75 years ago, uh, people did not yet know how the sun, the source of all life on Earth, worked. So we have come a long way, but it would be foolish to think that the journey has come to an end, to claim that God can somehow be seen uh, shining through the observations and theories of modern cosmology, simply over eagerness. It is a bit like a small boy shouting from the first step of a very long ladder, now I am in heaven, I can already see God. Whereas in reality, he only sees shadows of the canopies of tall trees. Now, scientific evidence is like a coin. Uh, it has two sides, evidence for and evidence against. Uh, one cannot exist without another. There are no one-sided coins in science, but plenty in the world of cheating and make-believe. Can the universe exist without God? To me, the task of those who would like to answer no is not to list random probabilities or to repeat old logical arguments that are not even wrong. Their main duty would be to state clearly what it takes to falsify the statement the universe cannot exist without God. This is if they want to claim their beliefs are based on reason and evidence. This is if they really want to be self-consistent. If one believes there is scientific evidence for God, by definition, one should be able to list also the evidence against. 
So what is it, please? What would be the crucial experiments? What is the future observation or experiment that would make one abandon God? I do not want to hear windy sophistry, but, but well-defined empirical statements. If such and such will be found to be the case, the universe needs no God. If such statements cannot be found, we are not dealing here with science, but with simplistic faith. Religious belief disguised as scientific reasoning. Faith that tries to prostitute science by making it a vehicle for religious conversion. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. I want to thank the Veritas Forum for inviting me to participate in this morning's debate. And I also want to say how grateful I am to Professor Enkvist for his willingness to join in this discussion and his very provocative opening remarks. Now, the question before us this morning is rather peculiar because it requires Professor Enkvist to take the affirmative side in today's debate. The duty of the affirmative speaker in a debate is to present a prima facie case in support of an affirmative answer to the question under debate. It's the role of the negative speaker to then examine the case presented by the affirmative speaker and expose any weaknesses in his case. Now, the problem that I confront this morning is that Dr. Enquist, in his opening speech, hasn't presented any case for an affirmative answer to today's question, much less a prima facie case. Indeed, he thinks that the question under debate this morning is meaningless and therefore cannot have an affirmative answer. Now, in order to show that this is meaningful, all we have to do is define the terms of the question. By universe, I mean space-time and all its contents. By God, I mean a transcendent personal cause of the universe. The question before us then is whether space-time and all its contents could exist in the absence of a transcendent personal ground of its being. And Professor Enquist has just simply failed to address the question under debate this morning, and that makes a fruitful debate unfortunately impossible. So if I were to just sort of sit down right now we'd just be left with no answer to today's question, not an affirmative answer. But in fact, I'm not going to sit down now. Uh, rather, in the interest of promoting debate, I'm going to offer a brief case for a negative answer to today's question. I think there are good reasons to think that the universe implies the existence of a personal, metaphysically necessary being and that therefore the universe cannot exist without God. And let me give four such reasons. Now before these, I give these, let me address Professor Enquist's remarkable attack in his opening speech upon classical logic. He says that quantum physics shows that the law of excluded middle is false. I have two responses to that. First, that is simply untrue. It is a very tiny minority of quantum physicists today who adopt quantum logic uh, as an interpretation of quantum physics. You do not have to deny the law of excluded middle in order to hold a quantum physics. But secondly, in any case, this does nothing to deny the nine rules of logic which govern all rational thought. If you deny the nine rules of logical inference, you won't even be able to reason, much less to provide a refutation of the case. So the person who denies logic is in the position of using logic to deny logic, which is simply self-defeating. So, number one then, God is the best explanation of why the universe exists. According to the great German philosopher Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, the most fundamental question of philosophy is why is there something rather than nothing? Even if the universe is eternal in the past, we can still ask why there is an eternal universe rather than no universe at all. 
I can't think of any contemporary philosopher or physicist who thinks that the universe exists necessarily. For it's easy to conceive of a possible world in which a different collection of fundamental particles or fundamental fields exist, or even no particles or no fields at all. The universe, therefore, does not exist necessarily, but contingently. But if the universe exists contingently, then the obvious question arises, why? Why is this contingency realized when it didn't have to exist? What is the best explanation for the existence of a contingent universe? The atheist has no answer to that question. Indeed, since on his view there is no concrete reality beyond the universe, there cannot be an explanation why the universe exists. By contrast, the theist has the explanatory resources to explain why the contingent universe exists. It is created by God, a personal, metaphysically necessary being beyond the universe. If you ask, why does God exist? The answer is that God, like numbers, sets, and other mathematical objects, exists by a necessity of his own nature, if he exists at all. That cannot be said of the contingent universe. So we can summarize Leibniz's argument as follows. Premise one, every contingent entity has an explanation of its existence. Two, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God, so defined. Three, the universe is a contingent entity. Four, therefore, the universe has an explanation of its existence. Five, Therefore, the explanation of the universe is God. Now, I'm not claiming that Leibniz's argument is a knockdown proof of God's existence, but I do think that each of its three premises is more plausibly true than not, and that it therefore gives us good reason for thinking that the universe depends upon God for its existence. Number two, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Typically, atheists have thought that the universe is just eternal in the past, and that's all. That made it easier to believe that the universe exists independently of a transcendent ground of its being. But there are good reasons to think that the universe is not eternal in the past. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past is very problematic. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of past events in the history of the universe is infinite. But the real existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to metaphysical absurdities. For example, suppose that you had an actually infinite number of coins, numbered one, two, three, and so on to infinity, and I took away all of the odd-numbered coins. How many coins would you have left? Well, you'd still have all the even-numbered coins, or an infinity of coins. So infinity minus infinity is infinity. But now suppose instead that I took away uh, all of the coins greater than three. Now how many coins would you have left? Well, just three. So infinity minus infinity is three. In each case, I took away an identical number of coins from an identical number of coins and came up with contradictory results. In fact, you can subtract infinity from infinity and get any answer from zero to infinity. And for this reason, inverse operations like subtraction and division are simply prohibited in transfinite arithmetic. But in the real world, such a convention has no sway. Obviously, you can give away whatever coins you want. This and many other examples suggest that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that the number of past events must therefore be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever, Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. But then the inevitable question arises. Why did the universe come into being? What brought the universe into existence? 
there must have been a transcendent cause which brought the universe into being. We can summarize our argument thus far as follows. One, the universe began to exist. Two, if the universe began to exist, then the universe has a transcendent cause. Three, therefore the universe has a transcendent cause. Given the truth of the two premises, the conclusion necessarily follows. Now, as the cause of space-time and its contents, this transcendent cause must be an uncaused, changeless, timeless, and immaterial being which created the universe. Now, there are only two possible candidates that could fit such a description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an unembodied mind or consciousness. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the transcendent cause of the universe is an unembodied mind. Moreover, given the philosophical arguments against the possibility of an infinite past, there is no possible world in which the universe exists independently of a transcendent creator. And thus it is plausible that the universe cannot exist without God. Three, God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. In moral experience, we apprehend moral values and duties which impose themselves upon us as objectively binding and true. For example, it is wrong to torture a child for fun. On atheism, there is no explanation of the objectivity of moral values and duties. This has led some atheists to the extreme position that objective moral values and duties do not exist. As Michael Roos, an agnostic philosopher of science, explains, on naturalism, morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction and any deeper meaning is illusory. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproducts of social and biological evolution. There doesn't seem to be anything that makes this morality objectively binding and true. By contrast, the theist grounds objective moral values in God himself and our moral duties in his commands. The theist thus has the explanatory resources which the atheist lacks. Hence, we may argue as follows. One, objective moral values and duties exist. Two, but if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. Three, therefore, God exists. Now, notice that some moral truths, at least, seem to be necessarily true. Michael Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Notice here that Roos ascribes to moral truths the same logical necessity that characterizes mathematical truths. But then the ground of objective morality must exist necessarily in every possible world. So there is no possible world in which the universe exists independently of God. Finally, number four, if God's existence is even possible, then the universe cannot exist without God. God, as St. Anselm observed, is by definition the greatest being conceivable. If you could conceive of anything greater than God, then that would be God. So God is the greatest conceivable being, a maximally great being. So what would such a being be like? Well, he would be all-powerful, all-knowing, all-good, and he would exist in every logically possible world. A being which lacked any of those properties would not be maximally great. We could conceive of something greater. But what that implies is that if God's existence is even possible, then God must exist. For if a maximally great being exists in any possible world, he exists in all of them. That's part of what it means to be maximally great, to be all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good in every logically possible world. So if God's existence is even possible, then he exists in every logically possible world, and therefore in the actual world. We can summarize this argument as follows. 
it's possible that a maximally great being exists. If it's possible that a maximally great being exists, then a maximally great being exists in some possible world. If a maximally great being exists in some possible world, it exists in every possible world. If a maximally great being exists in every possible world, then it exists in the actual world. Therefore, a maximally great being exists in the actual world. Therefore, a maximally great being exists. Therefore, God exists. Now, it might surprise you to learn that steps two to seven of this argument are relatively uncontroversial. Most philosophers agree that if God's existence is even possible, then he must exist. So the whole question is, is God's existence possible? Well, what do you think? The atheist has to maintain that it's impossible that God exists. He has to say the concept of God is logically incoherent. But the problem is that the concept of God just doesn't appear to be incoherent in that way. The idea of a maximally great being seems to be a perfectly coherent concept. So I'll just leave it to you. Do you believe as I do that it's possible that God exists? If so, then it follows necessarily that he does exist and the universe cannot exist without God. Together, I think these constitute a powerful negative case to think that the universe cannot exist without God. Thank you for both of these opening remarks, and now I ask Professor Avery to respond. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> now, I am... Uh, just a second. I said time. Okay, you'll set the time. 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 Okay, so I am a scientist, and for scientists, it's important to define concepts and, and the framework <laughs> of discussion in an, an ambiguous way. And this is even before we can, we can start to argue about some proposition. And my, my feeling is that that uh, framework has not been set uh, by, by Professor Gray in, in a clear way. I, I must confess, I did not really understand Professor Gray's definition of God. But maybe that's my problem. now. I, I think the problem of Professor Drake is that he misunderstood my point about logic. I am not advocating any form of a quantum logic. It is just a simple observational fact that laws of classical probability theory fall at, at, quant, uh, at the quantum level. At, in the micro, uh, microphysical world, the laws of logic as we know them do not hold. This is a fact. This is a scientific fact, an observation. Logic, of course, and the laws of classical probability theory hold extremely well at human scale. And, and in fact, this is one of the problems of quantum physics, how the classical world that we observe emerges from quantum reality. But that's a, another question. That's a scientific question. Now, Ludwig Wittgenstein was arguably the, the greatest philosopher of the last century. However, he did not believe in solving philosophical problems. Rather, he, he thought that, that most philosophical problems are only pseudo-problems uh, that arise from a misuse of ordinary language. And I wish to uh, make a similar point here, or, or to get a clarification uh, regarding that point. In my view, uh, questions like, can the universe exist without God are not solvable or meaningful. And for the people who think otherwise, I wish to point out that both their logic, because of the neglect of, of, uh, 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 of, of the fail or the neglect of the failure of classical logic at the very foundations of reality, uh, and because uh, 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 so both the logic and the empirical statements perhaps are on shaky ground. So this is my first point. And even more condemning is the fact that they are not fully committed to their point of view. They refuse to admit that they could be wrong. And this is my second point. And uh, let me 
Let me explain. Uh, I, I, I could of course be wrong and I could be simply stupid, uh, but, but the thing is that uh, when uh, Professor Prague is saying that God is the best explanation for the existence of universe, he seems to implicate that there are some arguments against this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, uh, his, his uh, uh, belief. And the question is, what are the arguments? What exactly Professor Prague sees are the arguments against the existence of God. And if you have arguments, as I said it already once, if you have arguments for, you will always have some arguments against, if you are discussing science. The, an example is dark energy, that in cosmology is one of the, perhaps the biggest problems, and perhaps also the more, one of the most interesting problems. Uh, that we have. There are many arguments for the existence of, of dark energy, but I could easily uh, list a, a number of arguments uh, against uh, the existence of, of dark energy. And I could spell out in great detail the circumstances under which I, I, I as a believer in dark energy, the circumstances under which I would say, yes, okay, fine, dark energy does not exist. The exact form and the content of these arguments, I don't think that's, a, uh, that's not an issue that we should discuss here. I'm just pointing out that this, this is really the format of a scientific discussion. You present arguments for, and you equally well present the arguments against. So, so I, would, I would really like to hear what in Professor Craig's view are the arguments against. And, and, and what are the observations and the experiments that would uh, lead him to take the conclusion that he has been wrong? So what would be the arguments? Uh, can Professor Craig swear that if future observations, if future experiments will uh, show such and such things, that he will, he will abandon his faith. I, I think it's a, it's, it's, it's a question that one, one can legitimately ask. Uh, equally as everybody can ask me, what about dark energy? How long will you, will you support the idea of, of dark energy? What are the circumstances under which I, I, I admit that I have been wrong? And I have been wrong many times. And I'm sure I will be wrong many times in future. I might be wrong right now. That's, that's not the issue. So I, I think we need to set uh, sort of um, the frame more, more uh, in a more well-defined way before we can even start to discuss the, the logical arguments, which are the same logical arguments presented many, many times, many, many hundreds of years that Professor Craig uh, discussed just, just before. So please, what? do you think are the, the main arguments against the existence of God? What are the main arguments against that God is not the best explanation for the existence of the universe? Well, I'm disappointed that Professor Enquist didn't respond to any of my four arguments to show that the universe cannot exist without God. Can we bring up that summary slide, please? Um, that God is the best explanation why the universe exists. Um, God is the best explanation for the origin of the universe. God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. 
If God's existence is even possible, then the universe cannot exist without God. These together, I think, give a powerful cumulative case to think that the universe cannot exist without God. Now, Professor Engfist has take, uh, based his entire case on the claim that it's meaningless to ask this question about whether the universe can exist independently of God. But I gave clear definitions of my terms. I said that by God, I mean a transcendent personal cause of the universe. He said, I didn't understand your definition. Well, what I mean by that is there is a personal, unembodied consciousness which exists beyond the universe and has brought the universe into being. This is the classical concept of God. And it's clearly meaningful to ask whether or not such a being exists. Now, Professor Enquist insists that uh, quantum physics forces us to deny the laws of cl classical logic. But again, I want to reiterate my two points. It is not true that you have to abandon the law of excluded middle in order to hold to the truth of quantum mechanics. For example, take David Bohm's interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's fully deterministic. It's in accord with all the empirical evidence, and it doesn't require any abandonment of classical logic. So it is simply not true that quantum physics forces you to abandon the law of excluded middle. It is a very tiny minority of physicists who think this. But secondly, in any case, I'm not appealing to the law of excluded middle. I'm using the nine rules of logical inference, and these are undeniable. You can't even reason without them. Does Professor Inquis seriously think that it is invalid to reason P implies Q, P, therefore Q? That's logically necessary. So if the alternative to theism is to deny logic, well, it seems to me that the, the non-theist is in really serious trouble there. They can never again say that theists are irrational for <laughs> believing what we do. So. Um, the other claim that Professor Inquist insists upon is his falsification principle of meaning. That if a claim is not falsifiable, then that claim is meaningless. Now I have two responses to this. First, the inadequacies of the falsification principle of meaning have been known since the 1950s. No philosopher today would defend the falsification principle of meaning. It's easy to give examples of obviously meaningful statements which are not falsifiable. For example, the sentence, I exist, is not falsifiable. In order to prove I do not exist, you would have to exist, which is self-defeating. So this claim is unfalsifiable, but it's clearly meaningful. Other meaningful non-falsifiable statements would include there are other universes composing a multiverse. I am thinking about X, whatever that might be. The world was created five minutes ago with the appearance of age. Mocking someone for his sexual orientation is wrong. Uh, the toys in the cupboard come alive at night so long as no one is observing them. All of these are clearly meaningful statements, and yet none of them is falsifiable. And so this falsification principle of meaning is just universally abandoned among philosophers today, and there's no reason to think that a claim that's unfalsifiable is not meaningful. But secondly, in any case, theism is falsifiable. Theism does pass the falsification principle of meaning. In order to show that theism is false, all you would have to do is uh, give some good arguments against the existence of God. And Professor Ann Chris asked what these are. Well, I read atheist literature all the time and discuss these arguments with atheists. One would be the coherence of theism. If you could show that theism is logically incoherent, then it would follow that God does not exist. So, for example, take the old questions, can God make a stone heavier than he can lift? Um, can God be omniscient and yet free. There are all kinds of these puzzles that atheists have raised to try to show that theism is incoherent. And if you could do so, that would falsify theism. Another argument, the problem of evil. This is a classical argument against the existence of God. In fact, I thought Professor Inquist might bring it up today. In order to show that the universe does, can exist independently of God, all he'd have to do is just show that God does not exist. 
Uh, so his task is in some ways much easier than mine. I have to show that God exists in every possible world, that he's metaphysically necessary. All he would have to do is to show that the evil and the suffering in the world is incompatible with the existence of God. Or if he could show that the universe is metaphysically necessary in its being, then it would need to have a ground of being in a transcendent personal creator. So theism clearly is falsifiable and therefore goes the extra mile in meeting the demands of this patently false uh, criterion of meaning. So to sum up, uh, this is clearly a meaningful question under debate today. We all understand the sentence, can the universe exist without God? Moreover, we see no affirmative grounds for thinking that the universe uh, can exist without God. And we've seen four uh, cumulative arguments to suggest that the universe cannot exist without God. So it seems to me that the evidence suggests that indeed the universe cannot exist without God and that therefore the most rational position to hold would be the theistic position. Yes, um, so uh, Professor Craig would like me to take the, the position that is opposite to, to Hayes and argue against and I, I, I don't know maybe I would be willing to do that but I'm, I, maybe I'm just slow and I'm still struggling with these basic definitions and, and let me yet again come back to this issue of probability it is simply not true that uh, a minority of quantum physicists uh, think that uh, uh, the laws of classical probability theory uh, for fail at the um, at the level of of microphysical world. This is an observational fact that has been repeated many times, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with some particular interpretation of quantum physics. It Bohm does not enter here at all. It is not an observation about quantum physics. It's an observation about about the world. a very profound observation that, that you simply cannot neglect by saying, well, you know, I don't care about it. It is a fact, it's an observational fact on a similar level that the, that the Earth orbits the Sun. And, and it, I, I think, I don't know what it means. I'm not saying that Professor, uh, Professor Craig's arguments are wrong because of that. I'm just saying that I don't know. It seems to me as if that the world at its foundations, the reality is much, much more complicated than we could have thought back in the Middle Ages, say. That even when applying the logic that we all believe is, is a solid, impeccable, unmovable, even that might be a, a dubious statement. This has nothing, and I, I say it again, it, this has nothing to do with how we apply logic to, to in our everyday life. This is just something that concerns uh, the world at its, at its foundations. And this we have found by doing painstakingly uh, 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 exact measurements by by reasoning that is very, very careful, and you cannot simply just say, well, you know, I don't like it, so let's forget it. It is there, and if you want to make profound statements, deep statements about the existence of the universe, about God, whatever that word means, you simply cannot uh, refuse to, to take any, uh, any real stand about the, the issue of... Uh, uh, failure of the classical probability laws at the at the level of of microphysical world, and uh, I'm not I don't I am not trying to deny that uh, at not yet that Professor Drake's arguments uh, for the existence of God as the best explanation for the existence of the universe that they would be somehow Wrong. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I, I still 
don't understand those, those uh, uh, arguments. But when he says that they are the best arguments, this somehow implies that there is something, some, something that is second best. And uh, what is that second best? I mean, all of these words that we hear about uh, morality and so on, that uh, I, I'm not sure how much we can trust this kind of uh, ordinary language, taking the position that Ludwig Wittgenstein also took, that the source of confusion, the source of all difficult philosophical problems is really the, the misuse of, of, of ordinary language. Therefore, it would be much more better if one, one can say in some unambiguous way, which is the scientific way, what would be, what would be the second best alternative? What, put, what would be the actual experiments, the observations? Not now, not today, maybe not even tomorrow, but sometime in future, what would they be that would uh, co compel everybody, include, including Professor Craig, to say that, well, God is not the best exp explanation for the existence of the universe. So it is, uh, I'm still trying to, to uh, see what are the alternatives here, and, and I think that is the way science proceeds. We map out the alternatives we do not commit ourselves to some philosophical standpoint from the very beginning. We map out some alternatives. And I would like to, I would like to hear what are those alternatives. What, what is the second best explanation? How could we, uh, uh, how could we verify that? Thank you. Now, in his last speech, Professor Enkvist says that he doesn't deny the soundness of the arguments that I gave, but he just wants to know, well, if God is the best explanation, what is the second best explanation? Well, with regard to number one, uh, on atheism, there is no explanation of the existence of the universe because there is no concrete reality beyond the universe. So there, clearly, I think theism is the best explanation because Atheism has no explanation. Another alternative, however, another explanation would be to say that the universe is metaphysically necessary in its being, and therefore there is no explanation beyond the universe because the universe is a metaphysically necessary being. But as I said, I don't know of any philosopher or physicist who thinks that the universe is not contingent, that is to say possible, but not necessary. Um, the origin of the universe, uh, what one could do there would be to say the universe is eternal, that the universe never had a beginning, but then you need to refute the philosophical arguments that I gave for the finitude of the past. Or you could say with Daniel Dennett that the universe in the ultimate bootstrapping trick brought itself into existence. It, it caused itself to come into being, uh, which I think is not a very good explanation because it's logically incoherent, but that's one that has been offered in the literature. What about objective moral values and duties in the world? Well, again, on atheism, what you could do is deny that there are any objective moral values and duties. You could just say that moral values and duties are the illusory byproducts of biological and social evolution. And therefore, it's not really true that raping a little child is wrong. It's, it's not really true that mocking someone for his sexual orientation is wrong. So that would be an alternative to that argument. And number four, uh, what you could deny there is that God's existence is possible. As I said, you could argue the concept of God is incoherent, like a married bachelor or a round square. And therefore, it follows that God does not exist because God's existence is not even possible. So those are the alternatives that are widely discussed uh, in the literature today um, concerning these arguments. Now, let's go back to Professor Enquist's remarks about logic and the falsification principle. He says, in quantum mechanics, the classical laws of probability theory don't hold. Well, now, it's certainly true that in 
quantum mechanics, classical physics will predict, for example, that a particle cannot penetrate a barrier. But in quantum mechanics, there is a small probability that the particle will tunnel through the barrier and appear on the other side. And so in that sense, of course, he's quite right. But what he claimed was that this forces us to abandon classical logic, like the law of excluded middle. And that's simply not true. The law of excluded middle says, for any proposition P, either P is true or not P is true. Either P is true or not P is true. And you don't have to abandon classical logic in order to believe in quantum mechanics. In any case, none of the arguments that I present are quantum mechanical in nature. They're all on the macroscopic level, where the law of excluded middle clearly holds. And my second main point was, in any case, I am appealing to the nine rules of logical inference, like modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogism, and so forth, that govern all rational thinking. And you cannot deny the logical rules of inference without using them. You're going to be in a self-defeating position. So again, it is a counsel of despair to try to avoid theism by denying the basic rules of elementary propositional logic, which are employed in my four arguments. What about the falsification principle? First of all, remember I illustrated that the falsification principle, that is to say that a statement is meaningless unless it can be falsified, is itself a false principle. It has been falsified. Uh, and this is universally recognized among philosophers. I gave several illustrations of statements that are non-falsifiable but are clearly meaningful, like I exist. So Professor Enquist is simply working with a wrong theory of meaning here, a theory of meaning that is not simply obsolete but has been exposed for its inadequacies for a half a century. In any case, number two, I argued that theism is falsifiable. Uh, if you could show an incoherence in the concept of God, that would show God does not exist. If you could show the, prob uh, the problem of evil shows that there cannot be a God, that would show God does not exist. If you could show the universe is metaphysically necessary, that would uh, show that God is not the ground of its being. So uh, theism is falsifiable, uh, and, and there's no way to get around it except by engaging the arguments that I've given for theism. And so until that's done, uh, we simply have no grounds for thinking that this is a meaningless question. So once again, to sum up, it seems to me we've got a meaningful question here before us, one that is debated constantly in the literature of professional philosophy, um, and one to which I think there are good grounds for giving a, a negative answer, namely that the universe cannot exist independently of God, but that the universe is a contingent reality which depends upon a transcendent, metaphysically necessary, personal creator of its existence. Final comments now by, by each yes, of the speakers. Yes, thank you. So uh, let me once more stress that this, the failure of the classical laws of, of probability have nothing really to do with quantum physics. The, it's a failure of classical laws of probability in nature. No matter what is the theory that actually describes uh, nature. Uh, you, can, you can go and Google it. You can Google the the uh, experiment of Alan Aspect, and you will find out all the information there is about this. So this is not an issue that is something to do with, to, to do with um, quantum physics. Um, the, uh, I asked now several, Professor Craig, several times uh, what is the second best, uh, uh, second best explanation, and we've heard uh, him repeating the arguments for his position and then saying, in effect, that if somebody could show my position is wrong, then it would be wrong. But what I would like to he hear is really a, a detailed statement saying that under which circumstances, what is the crucial thing for him and for the people who think alike that would uh, make them uh, abandon their position? And it is 
one gets this feeling that if, if Professor Craig is not really taking his own uh, position seriously, to the extent that he would be willing to defend it like I would be willing to defend dark energy, up to a point. But beyond that point, I would say, yes, I surrender, I do not believe in dark energy anymore. Uh, then you would believe that I'm serious about this. This is, I am scientifically uh, serious about the, my, my position of dark energy. But it is as if uh, the position about the, uh, the existence of God has already been decided before any arguments have been given for that position. And so if one does not take one's own argument seriously, why should anybody take them seriously? And you might also wonder, why is it that, that scientists uh, tend to shrug off questions about God and the universe? Is it because there exists an international conspiracy to, to promote naturalism? Could you... Could you truly believe that, that after receiving their PhDs, young researchers would be taken to a secret location where they are made to swear a solemn oath, that they would be forced to keep up, give up their Christian faith and seal the deal with the devil of naturalism with their own blood? Or could it just be that any real scientist recognizes the hollowness of the evidentialist arguments? that no matter how many times you repeat logical arguments, there is always room for suspicion. And it is not just because we are suspicious by nature, but because we have actually observed things that very much counteract, which are very counterintuitive to our logical thinking in nature. That, that's what we have actually observed. And I think the lesson of quantum physics is that you need to be very careful. And that is actually also the less lesson of general relativity, which tells us things like an empty, an empty, a completely empty space can expand. This is kind of a thing that is unthinkable, but that this is one consequence of the, of the uh, laws of uh, uh, Einstein's equations. So one, we, we should not really... Uh, commit ourselves to any deep metaphysical principles uh, on the basis of sort of uh, circumstantial evidence, on the basis of logic that, that we feel it cannot be wrong. Okay, thank you. In my closing remarks, I'd like to draw together the threads of our discussion today and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, I think it's very clear that we've not seen any good reasons to think that the universe can exist without God. Uh, indeed, Professor Enquist's position is that this is a meaningless question. He argued in his last speech that the experiments of Alain Aspect on Bell's theorem show that classical rules of probability theory fail. Again, however, the overriding point is there is nothing in the aspect experiments that suggests that the law of excluded middle is false or that the nine rules of logical inference fail. These are essential to rational thought. As for the falsification principle, he has not responded at all to my many examples of statements which are clearly meaningful but not falsifiable. He simply said once again, well, give me now a detailed case against the existence of God. Well, I should have thought that that was his job in the debate uh, tonight, but let me just give one example for the sake of debate. Suppose you believe that God is both free and omniscient. Well, then you could give an argument like this. One, necessarily, if God foreknows X, then X will happen. Two, necessarily, God foreknows X. Three, therefore, necessarily, X will happen. But if X will happen necessarily, then God is not free to do other than X. That would be an argument against the existence of God as an omniscient being. So that's just one example of the arguments that are discussed in the literature. I want to address, though, his closing remarks. Why do physicists, he say, ignore questions like the existence of God? 
And I want to say, first of all, they don't ignore it. There is a flourishing dialogue going on today between science and religion. Discussions over the origin of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, mind-body problems. There are millions of dollars and uh, thousands of hours and publications being poured into the science and religion dialogue in, an our, in our age. This is a flourishing field of inquiry. But secondly, the reason that physicists don't discuss these issues very much is because they're not trained to do so. Physicists aren't trained in philosophical thought. Timothy Maudlin is a philosopher of science, and in an article in The Atlantic in January of this year, he wrote this. He says, why would a physicist want to hand the question of time over to philosophers? The answer would be that physicists for almost a hundred years have been dissuaded from trying to think about fundamental questions. I think most physicists would quite rightly say, I don't have the tools to answer a question like, what is time? I have the tools to solve a differential equation. The asking of fundamental physical questions is just not part of the training of a physicist anymore. And so the crucial issues in the dialogue between science and religion are primarily philosophical in nature, and most physicists are simply not equipped to discuss those kinds of philosophical questions. In particular, they're not equipped to discuss arguments like the four arguments that I gave today. The contingency argument, the argument from the origin of the universe, the argument from objective moral values and duties, and the ontological argument for the existence of God. I think that all of these are good arguments for God's existence. Now, I'm not claiming they prove that God exists with some sort of mathematical certainty. Of course, there's always room for discussion and for skepticism. That's why we're having a dialogue like this today. But on balance, I think that the evidence on the side of the scale preponderates that says the universe cannot exist independently of a personal transcendent ground of its being and I'm not aware of any good evidence to suggest otherwise. And therefore, I am persuaded, until I see some arguments on the other side of the scale, that the most rational position to hold is that, in fact, the universe cannot exist independently of God, but that God necessarily exists. Thank you very much for for this dialogue and, and for this exchange of critical views and ideas. Uh, it, it would be very hard for me to actually summarize this debate here, and I, I don't think that's necessary. And uh, obviously there, there would also be many things that I would like to say about this as, as a philosopher, but I, I, don't, I simply don't have time for that. Uh, let me just point out in two minutes uh, that uh, I sort of find uh, both uh, views that have been defended here uh, to some extent problematic. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding Professor Craig's uh, defense of uh, the existence of God, uh, it seems to me, and, and this now goes without, <laughs> without argument, I mean, I don't really have time to, to develop this, but uh, since philosophers like David Hume and Immanuel Kant, I think there have been like severe problems related to these classical arguments or proofs of God's existence and, and, and it's uh, somehow, for me at least and for many others today, it's uh, not easy to, to take them seriously as philosophical arguments and not even easy to take seriously the idea that theism would be an explanatory hypothesis. Uh, so I would, in, in that sense, uh, be willing to argue against, at least to some extent. But then again... Uh, I should have had the debate with yeah. you tonight. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe some other time. Maybe some other time. But then, uh, All right. also, I mean, I, I wouldn't be happy to entirely agree with Professor Inquist either, because, uh, uh, first of all, this, this uh, idea of, of, uh, of having an observational fact about, for instance, the classical laws of probability and classical logic, failing at some point. In order to have observational facts, you have to have some, some uh, background context of, 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 of logic and, and other assumptions that you use for interpreting any observations that you make, and in, in, indeed to make any observations at all. So it, it's uh, somehow difficult for me to, to understand the idea that we could simply have something as an observational fact about nature without, without any you know, interpretation. Uh, background assumptions and so on. Anyway, uh, this would require another debate. So uh, 
final comment uh, would be that uh, it's not entirely clear to me on the basis of this debate how or indeed whether any of these two speakers would, would, would actually be genuinely willing to, to, to give up their own views and, and, and admit that the opponent was right. I mean, that's hard for all of us, obviously. Uh, so in that sense, uh, uh, I, uh, I think this, this leaves us to an open, open situation. Anyway, uh, as we're committed to genuine inquiry, we, sh we should of course always be willing to revise our own, own beliefs uh, whenever we find that necessary. But now at this point, uh, I would like to open, open the discussion to the audience. So I suppose there will be a microphone circulating around. So, uh, so any questions? Uh, all right. She was, uh, first. she was first. I have to go here in order to see better. Okay, uh, Professor Enquist, what would be your best or second best explanation for the origin of the universe or why it exists? I don't know. Well, why should I have one? I mean, we don't know, as human beings, we don't know everything. So I, I really don't know. I have... Best guess? Best guess? Well, I, I, I think the, the, the notions of beginning uh, that's related to the notion, our notion of time and the reality of time, that's something which I believe we don't really understand yet. And I think there are many indications that this is, this really is true. I mean, somehow time must get blurred at the quantum level. And what does it mean to have uh, a blurred time, a blurred causal sequence? I don't know. So I can easily imagine a situation where the universe is infinitely old. There might be some philosophical arguments against, against infinities, but you know, there has been, during the past few thousand years, there have been many philosophical arguments against many things that later have, have proved to be uh, either right or, or correct in some way. So I don't know. We'll, we'll have just to have to admit that at this point of time, we don't really understand everything about the universe. Not now, but maybe tomorrow or day after tomorrow. Okay, next question, please. Professor Greg, uh, we often hear it said that human can't have uh, kind of disproved the classical proofs for God. How do you respond to that? Yeah, that claim surprises me because contemporary philosophers of religion have extensively discussed the objections of David Hume and Kant to the cosmological, teleological, ontological arguments, and I think of decisively. Um, refuted those. Uh, in my own work, if you look at my published work, I extensively discuss Hume and Kant's objections and show where they're unsound. So it's not enough simply to drop the names of some famous philosophers and say, oh, they've refuted the arguments. You've got to look at the refutation specifically and then uh, show that they, they work. And I don't think you can do that with Hume and Kant. To take just one example, um, Kant attempted to refute the ontological argument, my last argument, by saying that existence is not a property or existence is not a predicate. But the version of the ontological argument that I gave doesn't assume that existence is a predicate. It doesn't assume that existence is a property. So his argument or objection to the ontological argument is just irrelevant to the version that I've given. So that would be just one example of where contemporary philosophy of religion has gone far beyond these 18th century objections to the classical proofs. Okay, next question. I would like to ask uh, Professor Enquist that uh, where did the laws of quantum physics that uh, produced the virtual particles come from? I don't know. Uh, my question is to uh, Professor Request. Um, you several times mentioned that um, Dr. Crick doesn't take his views seriously because they are not kind of proven by scientific method, and it seemed to me that you consider science the only legitimate way to knowledge. Could you tell me which scientific discovery brought you to that conclusion? Hmm.
Well, it, it seems to me that I, I'm not really, I'm, I'm not, I try to avoid of taking any philosophical standpoint. I'm not saying that the scientific method is, is the best, best method there is. I mean, for all we know, the most reliable source of information might be a, a, a minor spirit called Gudrun. I mean, Gudrun could reach us through email and, and send us a, 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 a really a, a enormous amount of very, very accurate and reliable information. That could, maybe Gudrun is the best source of, of knowledge there is. I don't know, but while we are waiting for the uh, Gudrun to send us something, I think that practice and history just shows that uh, uh, scientific method seems to be the best way to produce reliable information. I haven't seen, think, I don't know what, what we could think. Uh, if you can give me an example of some information, some, some fact of nature that could have been deduced by some other means than scientific method, I would be very pleased. I mean, I'm a lazy guy, so I'm, I, I don't really want to spend billions in sending satellites to, to the universe. If, if somebody could just, you know, uh, have all this information, let's say we have right now there is a, a cosmological satellite called the Planck spinning around in about one million kilometers from here, and we expect some information, some results early next year. One of them is uh, something called uh, uh, the uh, non-Gaussianity non parameter of the cosmic microwave background. And now is, now is the time to come up with that number. If, if you don't depend on, on scientific methods, then maybe somebody could here use some other method to tell us what it is. I don't think is possible. This is just practice and history that shows us this is the best way. We still have at least five or six questions. Uh, I don't think there can be any more than that. So, so next question. Okay, okay yes, thank you. The next one. The yeah, side. I've just got a question for uh, Professor uh, Craig, um, and it's about um, how you uh, move from the possible to the actual. Yeah. You talk about the existence of God. How you actually philosophize that, which is quite interesting. And I just wanted to know if. Um, um, if the journey um, from the possible to the actual could be done um, in the same way and uh, to construct a different God, and if so, wouldn't that actually cast doubt on how you define a God, or if you're talking about the God, and that would actually falsify who or what you define as God, would it not? This is a very good question, uh, and sometimes there are attempts to refute the ontological argument by constructing parodies of the argument um, where you would have a, a, con a different concept of God. The concept I used was St. Anselm's, the idea of a maximally great being. Uh, and in my published work on the ontological argument, I've argued that if the concept of a maximally great being is a coherent concept, and therefore possible, then it follows that these other concepts are impossible because there would be no possible world in which, in which such a being exists uh, independently of the maximally great being. So it's all going to come back again to that first premise. Do you think that it's possible that a maximally great being exists? Um, Professor Craig, uh, I see that you believe that Theism has great explanatory power. I, I didn't catch that. Explanatory power. Theism has great explanatory power. Okay. Theism, yes. Theism has great explanatory power and is the best explanation for many, many things. Yes. But um, I wonder, Professor Enquist, I believe, could say that because he believes in dark matter, then he can use it to form hypotheses and then go and test these. Yes. He can make predictions about dark energy and then test and if it proves that his theory of dark energy has predictive power, then it's also more credit to that theory. But um, I wonder what kind of predictive power theism has in your opinion. Yeah. 
I'm not sure. Um, I don't think that predictability is a necessary condition of either uh, meaning or truth. That's rather similar to this falsification principle. The idea that in order to be meaningful or true, a statement has to have predictive power seems to me to be a very controversial assumption. But if my arguments are right, for example, um, one would predict that the universe began to exist. I offered purely philosophical arguments against the infinitude of the past, and that would predict that therefore the universe began to exist. And that's a verifiable statement which theists have believed for thousands of years, and it's only been within this last century that we have actually had empirical scientific evidence of the truth of that statement that the universe began to exist. So that would be one example of a prediction. Um, take my argument for God as a ground of objective moral values and duties. I, I, it's not clear to me that the foundation of an ethical theory um, needs to have predictions. I mean, what would theism predict? It would predict, for example, that if you were to uh, say, take a little child and cut its face with a knife and molest it, that you would be doing an evil act. Uh, theism grounds a statement like that. Uh, now that's not a scientific prediction, but theism isn't a scientific hypothesis. Here we're dealing with ethics or meta-ethics, a ground for ethical values and duties. So it seems to me that there are some things that theism would predict, if my arguments are correct, but the predictability is neither a necessary condition of truth nor of meaning. Uh, I have a question for Professor Craig. Uh, if we argue that uh, the universe is uh, finite uh, and there cannot be uh, eternal causal regression, yes. then there has to be something which is eternal and able to cause the universe to exist. Yes. So how can we know that this something is person instead of something like a field which just causes things to be with no reason, like uh, Professor Enquist argues with quantum me mechanics? Yes, this is a wonderful question. I think an excellent question because apart from the personhood of this ground of being, we wouldn't be justified in calling this thing God. In my published work, I give three arguments for the personhood of the first uncaused cause. I gave one of them in my opening remarks today, namely, to be a transcendent cause, metaphysically necessary cause of space, time, and its contents, this being would have to be immaterial, timeless, changeless, and metaphysically necessary. Now, I can think of only two possible candidates for things that could possess those properties. Either an abstract object, like a number, a set, or another mathematical entity. These are immaterial, timeless, spaceless, changeless if they exist. Or an unembodied mind or consciousness. Abstract objects, however, cannot stand in causal relations. That's, what is, that's part of what it means to say they're abstract. Mathematical objects have no effects. They don't cause anything. So it follows from that that, therefore, the cause of the origin of the universe must be a personal, unembodied mind. So the reasoning here is, using logic, uh, P or Q, not P, therefore Q. And I think this gives us good ground. One, this is one argument for the personhood of the first uncaused cause. Um, my question is to Professor Craig. Um, it is uh, since scientific observations are do, do, done through senses, such as sight, is it possible to observe God in any way? No, not the classical concept of God. Now, certainly uh, on Christian theism, uh, the Bible often describes how God will give people visions. Well, Moses saw a vision of God, for example. Uh, and there are other stories in the Bible of people who have visions of God. But they're not literally seeing God because God isn't a physical object. And therefore, photons cannot bounce off of him and enter your retina so that you, you see him. God is, is a transcendent being beyond space and time, beyond matter and energy, uh, and therefore an immaterial being that cannot be 
seen by photons bouncing off of him and, and uh, impinging on your uh, optic nerve. What about like, let's say, somebody can feel God? Would that be a good enough sense? Well, now as long as you mean, as long as you don't mean physically feel, again, since God doesn't have a body, you can't have him impinge on the nerve endings in your fingers. But if you mean, can a person have an experience of God? I think, yes, I think that's very true because uh, I believe that we are not simply physical entities, uh, bags of uh, chemicals on bones. I believe we also have an immaterial spiritual aspect to our being as well. We are body, soul composites. And I believe in our soul or our mind, uh, we can have an experience of God in the same way that you might have an experience of the love of another person who cares for you, or you might have fear of another person. Uh, I, I think that that's certainly true, that you can, have, you can feel God in this kind of inner spiritual way, yes. Um, we are actually running out of time, but I think we have time for two very brief questions, so there will be one right here and then one on this other side. Uh, sorry for all those others who, who's, uh, uh, whom I didn't see early enough to, to, to notice they would have also liked to say something, but it, it's simply impossible given the time constraint to, to give everybody the chance to ask a question. So, two, two final questions, please. Okay, this is a question for both, both speakers. So. <clears throat> As a scientist, I, I'm also a scientist, and uh, of course I'd like to have scientific answers to these big questions, but, uh, but uh, in my opinion they are not forthcoming at the present. But my question is for both of the speakers, isn't it better to have at least a philosophical argument than none at all? Because, because anyway, when you are selecting a worldview, you are using philosophical stuff because science doesn't give the answer at the moment and everyone is basically picking a worldview anyway. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can take the, the two final questions both and then, then you can give your final responses to both. Of them. So there, and then. My question is to uh, Professor Enquist. Do you say that dark energy is the cause of the existence of the universe. Maybe if I can begin to, to, to respond. So, so of course I do not say that dark energy is the, the reason for the existence of the universe. I, jo I was just using it as an example of something which is, which is unknown, unclear, but scientific. Uh, and I, as I said, I think repeatedly, I don't really know everything there is to know about the universe. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worse off than, than Professor Craig in that sense. <laughs> now, then the question is whether it's better, in, in the absence of knowledge, whether it's better to have some philosophy than no philosophy at all. And, and uh, again, I must admit that I don't know. I mean, what, how do you measure that? In, in what sense better? In the sense that it will make you happier? In the sense that it will make other people happier? I don't know. In the sense of a good logical argument. I guess there are most of the things in life are such that you can't get a scientific answer. So I, I would say that yes, of course, it's good to have some, some sort of a philosophy, it's good to have arguments, but, what, but at the same time I would advocate uh, in, uh, care in the sense that uh, do not be carried away by these arguments. They are only temporary, they are only provisionary, and they might be superseded by some other arguments, even more powerful in, in, in the future. So, it's okay to have a philosophy, it's okay to, to make arguments that you feel are correct, but one should not uh, take them to be the final truth, because as we've seen during the past 100 years, our, the, the, our whole world view has changed in, in a dramatic way, as I tried to point out, that 100 years ago people didn't even know that there, there is something outside the Milky Way. And who knows what will happen in the next 100 years. And I'll be very happy to sit here and 
and discuss that in, in 50 years' time. <laughs> I thought it was very telling the way Professor Enkvist interpreted the question that was asked. The question was, in the absence of a scientific argument for a conclusion, isn't it better to have a philosophical argument at least? Professor Enquist repeated the question by saying, in the absence of knowledge, isn't it better to have a philosophical argument? And you see the equation there, equating knowledge with scientific argumentation. And as the one uh, lady indicated in her question, that is a reductionistic view of what constitutes knowledge that I think is just indefensible. It is a philosophical claim to say that science is the sole source of knowledge and the only arbiter of truth. The question of God's existence, of moral values, uh, of uh, the possibility of a necessary being, these are philosophical questions and therefore need to be handled in philosophical terms. Now, what is the role then, or what role can science play in discussions of God's existence? Here's the way I would put it. Science can furnish evidence in support of a premise in a philosophical argument leading to a conclusion that has theological significance. Let me repeat that. Science can provide evidence in support of a premise in a philosophical argument for a conclusion having theological significance. And a great example would be the cosmological argument. Uh, if the universe began to exist, uh, the universe has a transcendent cause, the universe began to exist, Therefore, the universe has a transcendent cause. That second premise, that the universe began to exist, is a theologically neutral statement that can be found in any textbook of astronomy and astrophysics. It is a question to which scientific evidence is definitely relevant. So science can provide some evidence for a premise in a philosophical argument that leads to a conclusion that has profound theological significance. So I welcome uh, science as a dialogue partner in the search for truth about the existence of God. And I want you to say in closing how much I've enjoyed our dialogue today and I'm so pleased that you've come. Uh, Jan and I have really enjoyed our time here in Finland as we uh, leave this afternoon. We're very, very grateful for uh, the, the wonderful time you've shown us and the, the good dialogue that we've had with you to, this morning.